This exciting discussion dives into the strategies that help in crafting immersive brand experiences using such modern techniques. To share their invaluable insights, we have our session's moderator, Mr. Carlos Maldonado, CEO and co-founder of Cleo Claire, I hope I pronounced that right. I, our panelists, Mr. Rick Johnson, Vice President of CMI Media Group, and also Dr. Jocelyn Ramos Campbell, Founder and President of Mommy Innovative Media. Let's invite them all to the stage with a huge round of applause. That was huge. That was all awesome. Right. Yeah. Woo! Take it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. Well, hello, guys. Hi. First of all, I want to say that it's an honor to be sharing this uh, this this space with you. I know that you're experts in your in your area, so I'm very happy and thankful to be here. Uh, my name is Carlos. Uh, I um, I'm in the travel industry. Uh, I have a, my, my my background is marketing. I I I work in digital marketing it, uh, for like ten at least uh, ten years, and then I founded the this travel business. Uh, and I've been working there in the marketing uh, operations and marketing since uh, uh, 2017. Uh, reinventing ourselves after we're still in this post-pandemic uh, uh, transition that uh, we actually didn't know if we were going to survive or like what was going to happen after that. So it's been it's been challenging. It was a surprise that oh we're going to travel again fast and now we're reinventing everything. So I'm very excited to be here. Great. Uh, so um, again, Rick Johnson, I am the Vice President of Audience Intelligence for CMI. Uh, CMI is a healthcare media company. Um, so the vast majority of my experience is in the healthcare space, but I do have, uh, I spent some time um, at General Mills, so I do have CPG knowledge as well. And um, it's been interesting to see how um, the shift has taken place where basically people were dictated to when it came to their health care. And then really with the Affordable Care Act, um, there was an opportunity for people to sort of shop around a bit and try to look at, you know, when it came to an actual marketplace to buy your health insurance, that was one area. Then you've got these um, private exchanges so for health insurance, that's one area, but then when it comes to um, some of the different uh, treatment plans or therapies, people are still able to shop for those items as well. So it's uh, been amazing to see that shift. Thank you, Rick. So Just I'm through. Dr. Jocelyn Ramos Campbell, and so I have been in the marketing media space for over 20 years. Um, I used to be a public relations executive in the Obama and Bush administration, and for the last 20 years, I have been the president of Mommy Innovative Media, which is a digital marketing communications company. I've been an online and on-air spokesperson for brands and for small businesses. And um, so for my online shopping habits, I kind of hit all the demographics that people like to hit. I am a Latino. American. I have a multicultural home. I have been um, leading with a multi-generational family. I have a special needs um, son. I have an atypical home. So whatever you need, I got it. <laughs> so we, I am able to, I also run uh, blogger campaigns, influencer management. So whatever you got, I check it off on the list on the census report. <laughs> So when it comes to online habits um, and what people are looking for in those kind of sense, we, I am one of those people that I like to online shop. We create campaigns for shopping online for brands and for businesses. So this is something that um, is in my field house I like to talk about. So I'm glad to be up here with these um, wonderful individuals as well. Thank you, Jocelyn. Um, I, yeah, it's, 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 it's a great topic and, and uh, I think it's been um, fascinating how we can adapt and how we have reinvented ourselves, our marketing plans, uh, our, our, our companies to keep um, uh, answering to the needs of our, of our, of, of, of our, of our users. Uh, 
And um, yeah, I, I was thinking about a very specific topic, that uh, uh, example, uh, how we've been reinventing ourselves. Before I, I uh, before I start about about uh, one 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 personal experience, I admired the airlines, for instance, during during this transition. Uh, uh, at the beginning of of of, um, of 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 the pandemic, they couldn't like. Of course, we we were not supposed to travel. We didn't know what was gonna what was, what was gonna happen. A lot of a lot of airports were closing borders, and then the airlines. What they said is, uh, no, we're gonna sanitize everything. They were sanitizing everything already, but they just switched the, the message, and then everybody was like, okay, so we can travel. Then they completely changed the experience at the airport a little bit, and then we were t uh, keeping social distance. Uh, as long as we bordered, the social distance disappeared, and then nobody would have to wear the mask anymore, especially if you were actively eating or drinking something. So it was, it was funny, if you think about it. Uh, uh, what was impressive is how they shifted the message and how they made people jump in. They lowered the prices as well. Uh, and right now, we just had two weeks ago the highest number of airplanes uh, flying simultaneously at the same time in the history of the world. So it's crazy. Wow. Oh, and the highest, uh, the highest uh, prices that we've seen also. You don't what was a one hundred dollar route now is three four hundred dollars. You're paying crazy, crazy, crazy amounts of money for for your ticket. So it's I I, I think that's a great example of of, of an industry that uh, adapted really well to the to this um, um, change. Of course, is is they have huge budgets, right? Uh, what kind of experience did you did you guys have in that in that field? I don't know if Justin, you want to share something with us about. Actually, if you don't mind, can yeah. I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, so you touched on the airlines, but um, cruise ships had this huge challenge because they would find somebody with COVID and then nobody would let them, you know, go to a port to unload. And, um, you know, it felt like that was happening, you know, on a fairly regular basis. And then you'd follow the story of the ship that like, they, you know, they couldn't land anywhere. Um, and, um, you know, I just, uh, when I was thinking about taking a cruise, it was amazing to see, you know, all of the um, the marketing effort that was made toward like safety and different protocols. Um, has the you know what you talked about for the airlines has that also worked for the cruise lines? Like, are they kind of back to where they were, or do they still, you know, are they not quite there yet? So. The traveling, the traveling industry itself, in a global perspective, is in, it has recovered incredibly well. Uh, we have uh, inflation has has uh, also be, uh, has taken part of it, but like the, the prices that we're paying for accommodation for, for for flights for any kind of experiences are higher than ever, and cruise ships are also are, are also back are also back there. Um, we have. Uh, MSC has a uh, new routes in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, um, when it comes to the United States, Caribbean, and, uh, and, and Europe, they have recovered. I don't really have the, uh, I don't have the knowledge about Southeast Asia. They took a little bit longer to recover and to open their borders. So I, I don't know how to tell you about Southeast Asia and, 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 and that particular uh, region of the world. Uh, specifically, however, in this part of the world, is 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 impressive how they recovered their business. Partially because people were already they, they were everybody was tired of being at home, mm -hmm. and they, right. on, like we needed to be outside, uh, talking to people again mm -hmm. and experiencing life as we knew it. And uh, yes, of course, we had all these new digital experiences and ways to uh, get products and um, uh, experience the world and, 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 and uh, augmented reality and virtual reality and all these gadgets. But we, we, we cannot forget we're still humans looking for connection and, right. and, and looking for a human experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yes, the, 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 the cruise ship industry is doing amazing That's great. Already. That's mm -hmm. great. Awesome. Well, to answer your question about um, you know, how did shopping essentially like for healthcare, how did some of that change uh, maybe pre-pandemic to now? One major change was 
uh, of course, you, you couldn't go into a doctor's office for the most part, right? Because uh, they were scared that, um, you know, somebody might have COVID and come in and then infect the staff and infect all the other people sitting in the waiting room. So the, uh, you know, what the healthcare industry was able to do was pivot fairly quickly to telehealth. Um, if you look at people who were interested in telehealth or thought that was an option pre-pandemic, um, both on the patient side and on the healthcare provider side, um, you know, some people saw, you know, that it was convenient and you can, you know, if, you, if you've got a sick kid, you don't want to have to drag them all the way down to the, to the doctor's mm -hmm. office. It's nice to be able to just have a telehealth visit. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, you know, became something that was a fundamental change. So uh, helping people, uh, giving them another option uh, when it came to taking care of their healthcare needs was, you know, massive. Um, a massive shift and it allowed people um, to recognize another shopping option. So they don't have to just go to, you know, is it an urgent care center, my doctor or an emergency room? Now there's a whole other option that opened up in a practical terms for those folks. So um, that was one, you know, one big area. The other thing that we saw was, um, you know, people still were supposed to be getting, you know, uh, those six month checkups and cleanings for the dental office or going in for routine screenings for their health care and th you know, things where you had to get like a, a blood screen, etc. <clears throat> that didn't go away, but there was pent up demand after the, you know, things sort of slowed down with the pandemic. So then there was a different like uh, shopping challenge where people were like, okay, I'm going to go back to the dentist and I'm going to get that cleaning done because I, I missed, you know, whatever, maybe my last two. Well, now they've tried to get it. Everyone's thinking the same thing and they're trying to get into their dentist. So it really put a lot of pressure on providers to make sure that they were able to meet demand. Um, so, you know, they, it was, they went from like famine to feast. So that was a real challenge and trying to, um, you know, message around that, that like, look, everyone's trying to do this. Please be patient. We want to fit you in as soon as possible. We're expanding our hours. And oh, by the way, we still have, you know, thoughtful safety um, procedures in place. So it was really interesting to see um, that change in terms of shopping behavior and what was being offered. I think um, on the side of kind of also for healthcare, on the side for education has also for parents. Um, we were told in the beginning when the pandemic started, our world instantaneously changed to digital. And we know before that, the pandemic, we were always told whether it was work, like we can't go to digital, not everybody can do that. And overnight, our world changed to digital. And so that also changed for our children, for our education. All of a sudden, everyone, all of our kids had to go to the digital world. And so that opened up for our children all of this educational options that they didn't have before that were all digital online schooling and that also opened up all this online educational portals. So for our parents, we had all of a sudden all of these educational options that were online that we didn't, some of us didn't even know existed, everything from kindergarten through 12, but also all of these extra educational options that were things that were for after school enrichment and clubs and college, you know, is, and so many things that we didn't know for our children that were available, but it also opened up for kids that had special needs. They were healthcare uh, situations that therapies that they had to take, like what all of a sudden do you do now when your child who had to have therapies, you know, physical therapies, now they were switched to an online model and not all of a sudden could they do that, you know? So now all of a sudden your child had to go to an online therapy when your child was only used to doing a physical therapy. So it now you have to shop around for the best online therapy, you know? So it brought about all these things Things that we were not used to and you had to really shop for these educational and therapeutic services that 
like we were not used to before, but it did bring up a, like a questions like, what is the best model that we can use? What is the best inclusivity, inclusion options that are gonna be best for us? So it really did bring up these options and it was really shopping, because now you're not only shopping just for like the fun of it, but you're shopping like what is the best choices healthcare wise, and also what is the best choices for our family? So this was brought up, the pandemic really brought up a lot of things for us that we didn't know about and things that are actually now that have brought up wonderful options that we're still after post pandemic that have now become part of your in part of the culture of your family now that you're still using after pandemic that's that's amazing because uh, we were we, we already had the, the the concept of of connectivity and and, mm -hmm. and, and physical distance as uh, not being a major problem like that was we already knew that before the pandemic however there was a lot of resistance to it mm -hmm. right we were in a lot of senses as you said we were still used to the previous uh, models uh, however it was uh, like a surprise for everybody and then we're basically experts in connecting to people mm -hmm. everywhere anywhere in the world which is which is um, it's, it's, it's fascinating at the end of the day um, and how we shifted like how uh, I don't want to say back, of course, because there is no, there is no um, it, things will never go, uh, will never be like they were before. Um, but how everything is going, uh, we're finding balance. Not everything has to be digital. Uh, not everything has to be uh, face to face like mm -hmm. before. We can have like, like balance is 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 is, is so important. Um, and yes, for, for, for us, I'm in, the, I'm in the travel industry. Uh, for me, my uh, area of exper uh, expertise is, is the Middle East, is uh, Spanish-speaking people traveling to the, middle, to the Middle East. I actually love the, what you said yesterday, like when, when you explained uh, the uh, focus of, your, of, of a lot of uh, marketing that you're, that you're doing, that is Latino mothers. Yes. It's impressive the amount of uh, Latino moms that are the ones deciding where to go, and they're the ones making the family go on a vacation. Yes. It's not the father, it's even, even if it's a stay-at-home mom or a working, uh, working mother, they are the ones deciding if, yeah. if they're gonna do it or not. Uh, they're the ones telling, the, telling everybody, okay, so get ready because in two months, in three months, we're, we're going. Go and where to go also, depends yeah. on, on them if they're going to, on a cruise ship or if they're going to Vegas or if they're going more like further away. So it's, it's uh, fascinating. Yeah. Um, but it, it it was very challenging, um, and we even thought at, um, about creating um, uh, virtual experiences where people will enjoy, let's say, Cairo in, 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 in Egypt, and, and people will be able to like, navigate their surroundings without going there, because we didn't know how long, how long mm -hmm. that was gonna be. And then we saw that people started to travel so, so, so fast after that that we actually didn't know how to handle that. But again, it's, I think it's very important to remember that we're humans at the end of the day, looking for that human ex experience and looking for that connection and, and uh, like feeling the heat if you're in a very hot place or hearing the, the humidity, like, we, like that's what makes this experience so, so beautiful. Um, do you have any, like, or do you guys have a, um, any kind of a particular situation where you like had to go back to how things were before, like uh, that everything was digital, but you needed to like find a way to like slow things down. Well, you know, in, in healthcare, again, so much of it, like you, you know, you for a lot of the treatment, you can't do it virtually. Mm -hmm. Like if you're going to have surgery, you got to show up. And you right. Gotta be there. <laughs> so. Um, I guess there are stories of uh, like that woman who was in the uh, the uh, um, Antarctic at a research station, and she had to like perform surgery on herself. But you know, she was a physician and like knew what to do. So if you're not a physician, you should you should, you should not try probably, this at yeah. home. Don't, don't do that at home. <laughs> right. That's right. Um, so in some ways, there's no substitute for some of those things, right? Like maybe you can convert an in-person visit with. You know, you've got some sort of rash on your arm. You could convert that to a telehealth visit. But um, for some of the other things, or like if you're going to have blood drawn or whatever the case is, that's, you know, there's no virtual version of that. So um, it was a real challenge, I think, for 
again, for um, the healthcare community to figure that out and to um, balance, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who are very nervous, people who have compromised immune systems, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they're scared to go into a doctor's office. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have people who objected to wearing masks who, um, you know, they used to call it the, you know, that it was just the flu. Um, and they really didn't believe that COVID existed. So then you've got those people too, and they're all coming to a, a healthcare center. So how do you, you know, how do you deal with all of that? So tremendously challenging. And I think that um, the healthcare system, you know, did well overall, you know, explicitly trying to explain to people like what they were doing um, and trying to figure out, uh, again, if there were times that were maybe a little less busy to direct somebody who was uh, immunocompromised to you know come for a visit then um, also trying to you know there's a lot more virtual check-in these days where before you'd have to go in get the clipboard write everything out and hand it back well now there are systems in place uh, where you can fill some of that out ahead of time so instead of sitting in the waiting room for half an hour maybe you're not only sitting in the waiting room for 15 minutes mm -hmm. so it helps mitigate um, those chances that um, you know, you'll be exposed to somebody that has something that you don't want to get. So, you know, that and also being thoughtful about uh, instructing who should be coming to this healthcare center and who should not. So um, I think, you know, all of those things um, helped make things successful. But again, um, going, you know, people had to go back to the old model to some degree in healthcare because there's no substitute for it. Um, so that might be a little different, but um, you know, Jocelyn, you might have a different take in terms of. Well, I just to piggyback back. what you said, um, in for my world, and I can speak to this as well. Um, it's having a compromise of both. So it's so great to have that user experience where you can see virtually what you're going to go into before you see it. So being able to see a doctor's office, like the inside of a doctor's office, before you go and experience it, you still gotta go to the doctor's office. There's gonna be things that you're always gonna have to do, but it's so great to be able to see the inside of an office, that 360 view before you go there. It's so great to be able to have that. So you go in there, like for example, because I share this online, so I have multiple sclerosis and I'm um, an MS, um, for the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. I'm an advocate for them for the Hispanic Association. So when I had to go through the pandemic, I had to go and get um, infusion, monthly infusions I have to go and do. But when the pandemic was happening, you know, I couldn't go to just any infusion center. Uh, they were making me check in to see which one I had to go to. Um, so it was so great to be able to see where I was going to go to, if it was a clean place, if it was nice, if it was, you know, uh, one of those ones that, you know, was not having too many patients there and all that. So, you know, I was able to select it, but if they didn't have that user experience where I can check the 360 of all of that, you know, that made a big difference to me where I was going to go to. So that was very important having that but I still had to go back to the old model because I still had to go in and do my monthly infusions. So that was important. Um, so, and then for things like shopping, I mean, I love online shopping. I mean, it's fabulous. I mean, who, I mean, we all Amazon people, I mean, let's, let's be real. You know, we all love Amazon, we all love shopping and all of that. But to be honest, you know, especially with kids and all that, that they grow up like weeds, there's times you have to go into the store. I mean, you know, you buy something even online and you've got to take it back and you realize, uh, okay, I've got to go into with my kids. I've got to go into the store. I've got to like actually check out what, you know, like even for their foot, you know, I've got to see what size they are because I bought this shoe online and this is not fitting them. So you still got to go into the back to the old model. You still got to go in, you know, to the store and physical store and buy clothing. So when you're doing that, you know, you want to be going into places. Now we're post pandemic. You see people that are not even 
not even wearing masks anymore. I mean, think about this conference even just, because there was conferences that were going on like after we were getting a little bit out of the pandemic, but people were walking around with masks and things like that. None of us, you know, most of us are not wearing masks and things like that here and stuff. So when you think about that, you're out of that. We're back to mostly the old model now, you know, we're post pandemic, you know, now. Um, but when we think about those things now that we're post pandemic, um, when we're shopping, when we're going to, you know, stores, um, it's so funny now when we walk in there, because if you think about just where we were even a year ago, would we have been in a store? You know, would we have even been at this conference a year ago? You know, you think like, oh my gosh, no way, a conference? Like, what are they kidding? This better be digital, you know? Like, <laughs> you know, but look where we're at now. So we have gotten really far, you know, where we're at. But when you're thinking about shopping and all of that kind of stuff, we are now going back to the old model. We are shopping back in line, but you know, we're shopping back in person, we're doing those digital purchases, we're going, you know, online, we're going back to the stores. Um, but it always helps. I love to have have that option to have those dual comparability to be able to see things and like go to know where I'm going before I go there and kind of see the lay of the land in case I just want to go in, run in and come back out, you know, and know exactly where I'm going before that. It really does help to have both. And I think that, um, you know, having both, it, uh, it can increase demand because now people are doing a little bit of research online, yes. mm -hmm. figuring out what they want, and mm -hmm. then they go and make the purchase. And I, that might be like when you were talking about how, um, you know, there were these virtual trips that you could take to Egypt or whatever the case is. If anything, you know, when you see a marketplace, um, that's amazing and dynamic and you know, yeah. the smells and the food and all that, you know, that it doesn't really come through when you're just observing it virtually, right? right. But it makes people want it that much more. Right. So helps make your decision about right. going there. That's mm -hmm. right. So if you have always wanted to like ride a camel by the, uh, by the pyramids, again, that sensory experience mm -hmm. of like, you know, interacting with that animal and being on its back and, um, you know, all of that, um, it just makes you want it that much more. Mm -hmm. um, so it probably primed the pump a bit, you know. And so, like, when you talk about the increase in business that happened, you know, some of it was pent up demand, but a lot of it was um, people had a way to interact online with those experiences and to learn more, and it deepened their desire, I think, to, to go. Um, and to a degree, some of that happened with healthcare where people may have been reluctant to get some sort of procedure, um, let's say getting like a hip replaced or something, but um, there was so much more information about how that process works, um, being able to like shop for those prices, understand what's going to be covered in your insurance coverage that, um, you know, because there was so much more information that was available online, um, not necessarily just because of the pandemic, but um, that was the, the pathway that was uh, that healthcare was headed anyway, that once the pandemic ended, people felt more confident in their decision that, you know what, this is, I should get that, that hip transplant that was, um, you know, or a replacement that was, that was uh, advised by my doctor. So they did the research, they found things out, and they were ready to go. Yeah, absolutely. It's is um, we've had the information already probably in a lot of in a lot of cases, but now the difference is that we didn't have we didn't have any other option. It was either you go online, do your research, and make a decision, or it's not going to happen. Right. right. And, and and it was terrified at the beginning. Then we got used to it, and right now we have balance because, as you said, like if I have a small rash like on my skin, why would I go right. uh, to, to the hospital? It's, you can expose yourself to, to different situations, or it's, it's time consuming also. And right. I don't love going to the hospital. It usually <laughs> is not because, yeah. because I'm going to yeah. a party, it's because I have some yeah. going on or one of my relatives. So um, I, I, I uh, find it great that we have, we were uh, pushed to learn how to do things in a different way. Mm -hmm. And that means right. options. Uh, and options usually make us, yeah, make, make everything um, great. There are so many. The customization that we yeah. have now is available. Yes. We have so much. Now we're able to create 
the itinerary that we want. I mean, you can put in now, like how many days you want, what kind of trip you want for travel. Right. I mean, you can customize it down to exactly what you want and come out with the trip you want. You could come out even for shopping for your family, exactly, you know, the child, the age, the, you know, the gender, the color, and you can get exactly what you want. So now it's limitless, it's whether it's travel, whether it's shopping for clothing, you know, um, even for an older generation, you know, you want to, you know, book them on a trip and exactly say it's for, you know, my parents and where they want to go to. So the customization that we're able to do through shopping Shopping now, this is even you know pre-pandemic is something that we've never had before in years before. Right, yeah. right. And Absolutely. I would I would even say, so I agree with everything you said, yeah. but just um, uh, again how things are packaged, mm -hmm. like in terms of being able to you know have all that collateral material to look at. I think that was one thing that um, uh, you know those who worked in marketing got a chance to do. The pandemic hits. There's this big decrease in certain areas of their work, but it meant that they had more time to work on, like how do you put together a compelling mm -hmm. package? They had more time to um, you know, explore how to talk about things and um, did a great job of that. Yeah. Um, and then I do think you're absolutely right. It feels like um, customization um, like compared to you know, maybe pre-pandemic or shortly before, like that it's night and day yes um, mm -hmm. that you can you can you know on like adidas.com you can design the shoe that you want right and you didn't used to be able to do that oh well, yeah know? no it's like way you're gonna get what you get and that's right. it um but not the case anymore so no i think that that's really helped uh, the shopping experience as well. And, and as marketers, it like, gives us options because now we don't necessarily have to think about a, a campaign for the store, for, the, for uh, traditional retail. Um, we can combine them. We can think about things of like ways to upsell them. They can, we, they can design their shoes, we bring them to the store to, to pick them up, which is usually the case in, right. uh, in, in Apple. A lot of people uh, love going to the store to mm -hmm. pick it up and then you can shop for more things because right. you're getting your new tablet and then you want your keyboard and you want your right. screen protector and right. you want your Apple Watch because it's not the, I don't even know what number it is. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, it brings much uh, more opportunities to us mm -hmm. um, and we have more options now right. so a lot of things are, are, are uh, very very positive and very um, uh, promising there's a downside to it somewhat in that now we expect all that so mm -hmm. when you go into a store right. and you're like well I want this in green and like, yeah. well, we don't have it in green we're sort of taken aback. I'm like, like, what? what? Like, you don't have any green. green. That's what I want. <laughs> That's, <laughs> so. It's exactly that. Or they just have the standard colors when they're in the store That's and right. they're like, what? What do you mean you don't have fuchsia pink? I mean, right. like, you know, like, That's right. what? I, I drove two this. hours for I that. drove two hours for this and you only have yellow and blue? What is right. this, kindergarten? Absolutely. Like, right. <laughs> primary colors? Absolutely. Like, <laughs> yeah. So there's this expectation that, um, you know, great, uh, you know, things have opened up and I'm able to get more of what I want and I can customize things. Mm -hmm. So now um, you've got to manage those expectations. Right. So you're trying to meet demand at the same time, like you can't customize everything. Right. So um, I think that's another challenge that, um, you know, you see on the, on the retail side. Right. So. Um, and that's why retail is going down. The stores are closing. So many of the retail locations are closing. And the online sales, of course, online is, you know, booming as always. And that's why you see the retail stores, you know, are closing so many. You know, I was just thinking the other day, like New York and Company, you know, which is for women is was always a staple in so many stores, you know, everywhere in the malls and outlets and everything. And they closed down. I mean, New York and Company was such a famous store everywhere. Right. And we're like, what do you mean they're closing down? I remember like women were like, what do you mean they're closing down? Because that was such a great place for solid pieces and for careers. And they're closing down and they switched to an online model, you know, and now online they're doing great, but they closed because they found out that the customization that they can give women online is was great and their online sales are great but at the retail stores women were coming in and say oh i found this in fuchsia and blue and this and that and now their online stores all i mean their their retail locations are all closing but online they're great and they're able to customize and they're able to do all these options and they just secured a partnership and look and that's another avenue 
they're doing, they're able to do more now. Like they just secured a partnership, um, you know, with the wife of um, Dwayne Wade, you know, um, you know, Ga uh, Gabriella. And I was like, so they're able to do even more and secure mega partnerships with, you know, celebrities, endorsements by continuing their model and switching it online, even though they're closing their retail locations. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay. So, you know, things that are, you know, happening for, you know, stores that even if they're closing, which seems like to us in back, you know, just like traditional marketing, oh my gosh, if you're closing your retail store down, that means what? You're filing for bankruptcy. It's the end of your era. No, it doesn't. It means like almost like they're getting a second wind, mm -hmm. you know, and they're able to continue it because now you're, you know, continuing your online sales, that's continuing and you're able to still put, do partnerships and you're able right. to do more. So, but you've shed that, you know, costly cost overhead, overhead. Mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, the the uh, cost of real estate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, unfortunately, the uh, the cost of those employees, employees who are working yeah, there. Right. So they're able to, to cut those costs and, um, you know, adapt. Right, adapt to now adapt. what 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 actually the consumer is asking right. for. What you know what we're asking for right. really. Right. You know, because we're the ones that are you know paying for the customization, the personalization, the demand of we want this, we want that. Um, and they are unfortunately, you know, getting rid of the employees and the overhead, but the consumer is still getting what they want, mm -hmm. which is the online uh, sales and shopping. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I, 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 I didn't remember that, that, that case. Yeah, they were huge. Yeah. They were absolutely mm -hmm. everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. yeah, there's another one, Shane, also. Mm -hmm. I, I never bought anything there, but they're huge and they're it's huge, only yeah. digital. It's only digital only now. Going, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that most, I mean, that, I'm pretty sure that there are a lot of opportunities for traditional retail, of mm -hmm. course. Of, it's, it's a challenge to get everything into consideration and it's incredibly expensive, as you, as you just said. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. You've got to find that balance, and that's the hard part. Yeah. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, where, um, you know, you have some uh, industries where they're increasing their uh, bricks and mortar presence. Right. Because people do want to like, there's that tactical, that tactile experience. They want to touch and feel and right. see and, and try out. And, you know, obviously you can't do that online and it's, it's um, you know, a challenging process. If you see something you like and you order it and it comes in, you try it, you don't like it, you send it back, you get something else. Well, this isn't quite it either. Yeah. It's like you could have taken care of that in 15 minutes if you just went to the, the retail to location. The retail location, yeah. 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 Um, so again, I think that um, you know we're going through this period of, of trying to find that balance, yeah. um, and uh, you know also like where where are these stores going to be located? Because it amazes me, so many malls. Right. You, know, you go to the mall and they're either like closed or it's a ghost town. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but other malls are thriving, mm -hmm. so. Um, again, I think that there's just this rebalancing that's taking place right now. Yeah, and the ones that are innovating. I, I personally, I, I don't do almost any online shopping. Mm -hmm. I, it's, it's pretty weird, I guess, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny that we're talking about this. this, this. Um, but yeah, I always find, and I, and I have a lot of friends, like once we talk about it, I assume that everybody's buying everything on Amazon or different online uh, right. um, providers. and, and I always say I don't I, I don't do it. I, I refuse myself because I st I I I, tr I try to get I, I think that I can still get the digital experience because I do like I do my research in Amazon and I do my research in, in, in on with different um, options. Sometimes I buy, especially like s certain things. Um, for, for for the conference, I got I got I got a, a shirt and mm -hmm. I got it delivered uh, to the to the uh, to the hotel. But I try to do it not as my primary option, and uh, I I think it's, it's it's pretty interesting. And and some instead of some malls, are, there are a lot of like uh, those massive tr uh, the streets with the like the uh, um, like the outdoor the outdoor like uh, outlet malls yes, yeah, yeah, yeah those yeah. are mm -hmm. not right. the outdoors also like not right, outlet right. but outdoors yeah, uh -huh. are, those are, are are getting huge. Um, I think that yeah, there are great opportunities for for uh, those that are actually paying attention and and, and looking. Um, um, I don't think that things are going to be the same in ten years, and I personally don't think that the same companies are going to be at the top in ten years. Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. 
so many things have changed since uh, 2013 until now. Right. It's crazy. Right. So 10 years from now, we can, I don't even want to think about that. Right. <laughs> That'd be but the same. Just great, great opportunities for us, for sure. Right. Yeah. No, no doubt. No doubt. Well, should we uh, open the floor up for any questions? If folks have any questions or comments, because it's always interesting yeah. uh, to hear from other professionals about their points of view or their experience, but especially when it comes to sort of the, the future of um, consumer preference and shopping habits. Oh my God, don't all raise your hands at once. I can't see you. Please. Wait, wait. Right, right. Please. <laughs> yeah, come on. Yes. Connection. I don't want people to forget about having to communicate. Being able to talk to somebody on the phone is an art, is a skill set. Right. You know, I sell my phone actually like $40,000, you know, $15,000, $21,000 for products that I sell all the time. It's done through communication. It's not via email. It's not, maybe the, the my, my lead capture sets an appointment for somebody to speak. That's using the technology from coming to the website to book in the appointment, then someone is speaking on the phone. But I just I just want to like, you know, the future with everything moving towards automate this, automate that, and, and, and advertise this and market this and digital that, like I just where does the face to face apply? Because I feel like I maybe I feel like a dinosaur still doing it. <laughs> yeah. But I'm making millions of dollars doing it and I'm the only one and it's like well, you're, you're not the only one. You're, yeah. 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 I, I yeah. totally understand what you're saying. Yeah. And I would say this, that, um, I mean, there's a fundamental premise that it was true 20 years ago and it's going to be 20 years from now. It'll be, still be true. And that is meet your customers where they want to be met. Mm -hmm. If your customer wants to have um, a voice conversation, you need to figure out how to make that happen. Mm -hmm. If your customer wants to meet face to face, you need to figure out how to make that happen. Um, so I used to run the healthcare practice for JD Power, and part of what we did was looking at um, different customer service and automated phone systems, and trying to understand like how do you know what's a, what's a good process versus a not good process. And uh, again, the key there was being multi-mode, meet people where they want to be met. Somebody wants to send you an email to talk about an issue and like write it all out. Great, you better have a team that's ready to handle that. Somebody wants to call and talk to someone, that's great too. Somebody wants to pay their bill automatically and doesn't want to talk to someone, that's great too. So you've got to just meet them where they want to be met. And that's going to continue to uh, be the case. It's just that we need to get better at it and we need to be able to make sure that um, if we say, great, this person wants uh, a voice conversation, the people are trained, they know what they're supposed to say, um, they're giving them the right information, and all of the, you know, the information that you get um, uh, through a voice conversation or online or going, um, you know, back with email correspondence, it's all got to be the same, and it's all got to, you know, make sure that it, it, they work together. So, I, again, things, in some ways they've changed, like maybe some of those preferences have changed, but that that premise will never change. You've mm -hmm. got to meet the customer mm -hmm. where they want to be met. Yeah. And it also depends on the on the product. It is proven that if you're talking about a, if the ticket is uh, below one thousand yes. dollars, 
your consumers are going to be more comfortable to make the, the decision and the purchase without talking with somebody else. Mm -hmm. However, if you're talking about a twenty, fifty thousand dollar or more, you need at least a phone call or a Zoom conversation, oh, yeah. or if it's even higher than that, you need a representative with you. If you're talking about millions of dollars, you need a person oh, physically yeah. with you to close the deal. Uh, you're probably getting the same information. You're probably getting the same reassurance that you will get through an email or through a chat box. Right. However, is how our psycho uh, we, how how it works psychologically. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's a, it was a great question. Um, I don't think that um, the um, traditional ways are going to disappear, definitely. Absolutely not. And there are great opportunities about, for that. Um, thinking about it, um, I remember about the, Tommy Bahamas. Is this, um, this store that only has a few, a few, a few, a few, a few um, stores, right? You go, they don't have a lot of, they don't have massive uh, uh, coverage of, uh, of um, stores. You can find only a few, a few of them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but you also have the, the experience uh, online. But what happens when, what they do is that the, uh, it's aspirational. People, a lot of people want to travel to a specific city so they can, they can go there and they can buy their items. So it's, as long as there is a, a strategy behind what they're doing, I think that uh, they're, they're gonna stay on float and great opportunities are gonna, are gonna happen for them. Yeah. Absolutely. Nothing takes the place, and I ended that in my keynote, um, nothing takes the place of hard work and meeting one-on-one -on -one with people. Um, and that's something that I think with these panelists, I mean, I think we have up here at least 50, 60 years of PR um, approach and hard work. And so one thing that you will know is that when your client is asking for, I want to meet with you first, and that could be the very first sales meeting they want to meet with you first, that's what you're gonna get done, is meet with them, assure them. Now there's gonna be times when you're meeting with a client and they say, listen, I wanna do everything through Skype, I wanna do everything through Zoom, I wanna do everything through email, that's what you're gonna get because that's what the client needs. They're on that time zone, that's what they want. But nothing ever takes the place of with way they say, I wanna meet with you one-on-one, -on -one, that's what you're gonna do. So nothing will ever take the place of that. Nothing will ever take the place of talking to them, assuring them, having to say, hey, you need me and, that's, and you, you want only me, that's what you're gonna get. So nothing will ever take the place of that. And I think the, of always having to let your client know that they're your, always your number one priority no matter what, clients need to know that. Um, and so clients, you know, and you could have 100 clients, but every client is important. You know, you could have 100, that's fine. But your client needs to know that they're number one in your book. And so when you are talking to your clients and when you're talking as marketers, we all know that, your client always has to know. They don't care if you have 100. They want to know they're number one out of that 100. They don't care about your other clients. They want to know that if they hired you, then you've got to be number one with them. So that's what you got to know. Give them that reassurance. So, and I think that's always important. And if they want that time from you, you give them that time because they hired you at the end of the day. So I think that's really important always, and that will always be important. Nothing ever takes the place of a smile, nothing ever takes the place of hard work, and nothing ever takes the place of, hey, I'm here, what do you need? Thank you. I, I, I asked about everything that you just said, well, all three of you, it was fantastic, mm -hmm. great, great answers to that question. And to your book at the Tommy Bahama, right, it's, it's also, I think, about the Harley Davidson, mm -hmm. same thing, people will travel all over the world to go to the Harley Davidson yeah. planet, yeah. Hard Rock Cafe, people will travel all over the world to go to the different ones to get the memorabilia from each one. So I absolutely love that aspect of it. Uh, another thing I just want to just touch base too is we're talking about marketing. If, if, may I ask another question? Yes. All right. So uh, as we're talking about you know, the direct to consumer and working with people on what their best way of being approached is, when you look at like the, the wealth, let's just talk about the United States for one second. The United States of America, the wealth of this nation is in the hands of the baby. Right? The baby boomers represent more than 50% of all the revenue, generational wealth of this nation. There's some from the generation before, a little bit as they start to pass away, and then you have the millennials, and then you have the next people coming up afterwards. But if the baby boom generation, to your point, we have to make sure that we're catering to them, because if we have a business, we're trying to go after growing and scaling our business, we have to make sure we're targeting the demographic as well, who has the resources and the best way to reach that demographic.
Is there, have you, I don't know, I may have missed part of it, I'm sorry, I was at another conference, um, kind of bouncing around, but if, have you had a chance to discuss some targeting strategies specifically towards the baby boom generation? Actually, it's the Latina who has the wealth. The U.S. Latinos here, they have $252 trillion, and we're not catering to them. So the U.S. Latina right now is the, has $252 trillion. One in every four Americans are Latino here. We are the largest U.S. Hispanic minority group, and it's the U.S. Latina woman who has the purse strings here and we're not targeting and marketing to them. That is the one that we should be targeting to. And it's the U.S. acculturated Latina, meaning the one who has been second, third generation here, who has respect for our U.S. Hispanic uh, culture and has been raised here, but we're not marketing to them. And it's not good anymore to just put something up on Google Translate. We need to see ourselves represented. We need to see ourselves because we're married here in this United States. We have been born and raised here. We are married usually to an American or whoever we decided to, but we have multicultural children and no one's marketing to us. Yet we're the ones who have all the money in this United States and no one's marketing to us. So, and when you market to a U.S. Latina, you're not only marketing to her, you're marketing to her entire neighborhood, to our community, and all of that. We run out of time, unfortunately. Yes. What a great topic. Thank you yes. for the questions. Thank yes. you for sharing Thank the stage, uh, Rick so and Jocelyn. Thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you.